by way of an overview of 25 years of my work. Haiti first drew me as a physician. On three trips there in the 1980s, I volunteered at Hospital Albert Schweitzer in the geographical heart of the country. And within moments of arrival, the place captured me visually. On a long drive to the remote hospital, there were stunning landscapes with stark denuded mountains, brilliant blue sea, and towering clouds above. Along the route, were villages of mud and thatch built in the style of West African ancestors brought enslaved to this island centuries ago, a testament to both tradition and unrelenting poverty. What most impressed me though, were the faces of the Haitians. It's a wonderful couple um, in their Easter Sunday finery. Um, in these faces, one could read the struggle of daily life amid daunting conditions, which they met with dignity and quiet strength. Pithy proverbs tinged with irony and wry humor, um, salted Haitian language throughout, and they served as commentary on this existence. So I borrowed some as captions for these photographs. Um, the caption for this one is, your face is your passport. And in the hospital compound, um, this man was a familiar sight, um, selling um, snacks to uh, visitors and families. His proverb is, if you're not a lion, be a fox. His concerned grandfather with his grandson in the hospital ward, as is his proverb, the tiger may be old, but his claws are never old. And this marvelous mother and child in the pediatrics ward, God's pencil has no eraser. With each tour of duty there at the hospital, I took home visual images emblazoned on my memory and really um, couldn't wait to get back there. Uh, it was in many ways, the most meaningful experience of my medical career. So in 1996, the hospital invited me back to work as a photographer. No longer confined to the clinic or the operating room, I could roam the area, um, the large hospital compound. And then I ventured further afield with the outreach teams um, promoting public health. And so we went throughout the River Valley, which was 200 square miles and um, entirely rural. And with these marvelous Haitians who could um, help me um, as I approached my potential um, photographic subjects, we went um, far afield to satellite clinics, um, to uh, places where reforestation was taking place and where vaccinations were being given to children. It was a, a wonderful experience. And um, en route, of course, I encountered um, many types of people, all of whom use the hospital as their primary medical resource. So I ran into laborers and farmers, craftspeople, plenty of children, this one eating a mango happily, um, and market vendors. Using my limited Haitian Creole and with help from my, my Haitian compatriots, um, I asked for their portraits. Many consented, but some refused. A response to be respected in a culture where those who possess little do not give their image lightly. This handsome man was uh, one of the local um, voodoo priests. He lived not far from the hospital. I met him thanks to a Haitian friend who walked me into a neighborhood where um, a large group of people were gathering together to um, have an evening ceremony and celebration. 
So they were busy preparing food and um, getting the, the outdoor um, worship area ready. And it was clear that um, I was not invited to stay for the ceremony because I was a non-believer. And as they say in Haiti, I was a blanc. Um, but they were willing, for, willing to have me um, visit and observe. And when I asked this man if I could take his picture, he made a bargain with me and said, you can have my picture, but then um, I want your hat. And I thought, well, he has a perfectly good hat on, but it was the idea of fair exchange. So I willingly said yes, because my hat was this, this rumpled khaki sweat stained pork pie and certainly was no prize, but it was, um, you know, the, the moment of exchange and the feeling of um, equality uh, that uh, came from this. So the photographs from this visual journey that best embodied the Haitian spirit came together in a volume dedicated to the people of the River Valley entitled The Heart of Haiti, which was given to the Schweitzer Hospital to assist in their fundraising efforts. And my hope has always been that these portraits stir viewers aesthetically while reminding us of our shared humanity with an impoverished and too often forgotten nation that lies so close to our shores. And I'm grateful that the Vassar Haiti Project keeps consciousness raised about Haiti and its needs and um, in their support of their clinic in Shermetra. Well, soon after publishing The Heart of Haiti, a new opportunity arose, a change of venue from the Caribbean to the Adriatic Sea, and I found myself in Venice, which is one of those places where just walking out the door puts you in a totally different world. Um, and it's a place where even the most mundane of daily activities can assume a fresh aspect. For instance, when you have to take the gondola ferry in order to get to the grocery store. Residing there intermittently over five years and in all seasons provided me the luxury of deep photographic exploration in varying light and weather. So November fog, summer sun. And with this exploration came the challenge of depicting a city that's so well known and so extensively photographed. The challenge was to do it in a personal way that would say something new and would not be a postcard portrayal. So this meant capturing moments of everyday life. And I don't think wash day has changed in Venice since medieval times. <laughs> And of course, serendipitous scenes walking along the narrow streets. A little tea party. And in a city devoid of vehicles, life proceeds at a walking pace. Um, and if you live on a high upper floor, you lower your basket for anything that someone is bringing to you. <laughs> There's time to dawdle and get lost in Venice, which happens often, since while the city is very compact, it is totally devoid of straight lines. Fortunately, its sinuous streets inevitably lead you to water, whether at the end of a cramped alley or along the sweep of the Grand Canal, which will eventually bring you out to the foot of St. Mark's Square where you might find a bronze lion sheltering a stray tabby. Splendid surface and crumbling infrastructure dwell cheek by jowl. And twilight and fog can turn a neighborhood into a stage set. And then the realities of land subsidence and sea level rise come home very forcefully in episodes of aqua alta or high water, which is a potent reminder of environmental fragility in this, this wonderful city that is just so close to the water that sometimes 
um, it's hard to tell where the water ends and the land begins. In 1968, fall of my freshman year, I took the first course Vassar offered in East Asian studies. China was not yet open to the US and the Vietnam War was raging. In the college bookstore, I splurged on an art book of black and white images of Angkor in Cambodia, the future of which lay in the balance as conflict overtook the country. Miraculously, it survived major destruction. And by the time of my first visit in 2001, just after 9-11, Southeast Asia had ironically become one of the safest places to visit. I wanted to tie together the vast and varied geography, peoples and culture of this region. So I looked to the Mekong River, which touches on its way to the sea, the countries of Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar. Um, I did good, significant parts of this journey by riverboat, which was also a great pleasure. Um, I traced the river from the Golden Triangle through upland Laos to the old royal capital of Luang Prabang, where monks line the river promenade early each morning for food offerings. And then south to Vientiane, the current capital, from where the river then fans out into the great delta in southernmost Vietnam. And um, sidebar here, um, some of these photos are now hanging in the World Bank office in Vientiane, Laos. And yes, I made it to Angkor situated near a tributary of the Mekong. Rising out of the jungle, the ancient city laid out like a mandala, awes with its massive monuments, the apex of Khmer civilization, a testimony to human ambition and the implacability of nature. The historic zone was the last, one of the last holdouts of the murderous Khmer Rouge, who conducted a civil war in which millions died in the killing fields. Many of the survivors were maimed by landmines, which took until 1996 to be cleared from this area. These wounded uh, Cambodians, unable to work, sent their children to beg in the markets. Of the four countries touching the Mekong, Burma or Myanmar is the least well known. Because it was largely closed to the outside world for 50 years under repressive military rule to which it has sadly returned. Its mystery compelled me to venture there by land and water to get a sense of this diverse troubled nation. From the old colonial capital of Yangon, I traveled north to fabled Mandalay, um, which was, of course, um, the subject of Rudyard Kipling poems and uh, um, some uh, corny songs and old Hollywood movies, and um, also was the scene of intense fighting during World War II um, between the Japanese and the British. And along the way, I took in the Theravada Buddhist culture. Here, yeah, the Buddha is getting bathed and um, these young men are gaining merit by so doing in the temple. And uh, up in the hills, I met uh, an irrepressible group of novice monks who um, were mimicking me as I took their photograph and then made this expression and they were having a good time playing. Um, and in addition to um, very uh, Buddhist rich country, there's animistic beliefs that um, are practiced as well. And 
small shrines um, are found in every village and city to um, spirits of the trees, the water. Um, there are all kinds of um, ephemeral creatures called the gnats. And so here in um, Yangon, a uh, big banyan full of shrines to the gnats. Beyond the lowland valley of the Irrawaddy River, which is Burma's equivalent of the Mississippi, both the terrain and the faces change. In the hills are tribes that have never willingly recognized a central government, not during the British colonial times, not during the, the military rule. They are fiercely independent. And um, many of them have been waging guerrilla actions against the government for decades. Um, this calmed down during the time of Aung San Suu Kyi's power sharing with the military, but I'm sure it will um, recrudesce um, given what's going on currently. It's, uh, way up in the hills in a place called Shan State, where there were very fierce warlords who defied the British and um, the Brits um, wisely left them alone. While Myanmar recognizes what it calls indigenous minorities, it has never recognized the Rohingya, descendants of Muslim Bengalis who migrated east many generations ago from what is now Bangladesh and have always been considered stateless non-citizens. As we know, genocidal action by the military has driven them back over the border into squalid refugee camps. And it was notable my first visit there in 2002, I saw many Rohingya. When I returned in 2013, none. So this action has been going on for a while. And I would long to return to Myanmar to visit remote areas best accessible by riverboat, sometimes only in the rainy season when the water level is high enough to get into the tributaries of the Irrawaddy. But pandemic and unrest have postponed my wish. Not all my projects have required distant travel. And this pandemic year has been a reminder that there is plenty of subject matter that can be had without a passport or a plane ticket. Not far beyond any city, a drive through rural small town America can provide ample material and suggest untold stories waiting to be imagined by the viewer. A collection of images from such rambles constitutes my book, Presence Passing. 15 years of wandering with the camera yielded images from walks along somnolent streets of small towns. I went through overgrown yards and fields into empty rooms. I was stalking time, that most elusive of prey, which, while invisible and ungraspable, leaves a wake that can be seen and touched. Its passage is strewn with that which is left behind, a broken trail of vernacular architecture, and cast off objects of private and communal life. Ah. The remnants speak to us, stir questions and prompt memories. We ask, who built these structures, filled these empty rooms, tended orchard and garden, here pursued a life. The visual evidence of other eras and other narratives invites us to wonder what each of us will leave behind as presence passes and absence overtakes.
to come up with visual ideas or projects, it's not necessary to leave home. There are elements of a still life close at hand waiting to be discovered in a kitchen drawer, a cabinet, or on a shelf. Commonplace items can acquire new life when combined in playful ways. Inviting the eye to linger over construction projects that echo the pleasure of building with blocks as a child, where part of the pleasure lies in risk-taking as perilous structures rise and fall. I lost a few cups and saucers in this. But <laughs> um, this was the inspiration for a series I call Balancing Acts, which allowed play with white crockery against a black background, where all the delicate shades of in-between gray come from the shadows cast by curves and contours of everyday objects. And I've returned many times to my childhood haunt, the garden, where the only constant is growth and change, to capture the natural world in the cycle of seasons. Sometimes I picked my subject matter and brought it inside so I could play with it at leisure and so that uh, wind and rain wouldn't get in the way, such as these um, very sinuous um, garlic buds waiting to blossom. And other times um, took my chances um, out in the field with these marvelous hostas unfurling in early spring. Um, okay. The opportunity to combine my medical background with photography came through my connection to the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, the august home of a museum of medical history and an historic library. With access to library stacks and museum storage, I juxtaposed materials to craft a visual history of medicine in a history with a deep medical heritage, and this became bones, books, and bell jars. Um, here, this articulated arm is resting against a seven, an 18th century um, book of anatomy with the most beautiful copper plate engravings, um, made at a time when um, it wasn't just the scientific aspect of the dissected cadaver that uh, was um, felt to be important. The, the surround had to be elegant as well. And, and here the, the marvelous um, artist who put this together included the rhinoceros, um, which I found fascinating until I learned that um, the rhinoceros was, rhinoceros was um, a, a very real animal um, at the time. Um, there was one imported into the Netherlands in 1741 and it toured the continent. So the, um, the artist who made the etchings um, felt it uh, perfectly reasonable to include the rhinoceros. Um, this contorted spine and rib cage from a patient who suffered terribly from uh, tuberculosis of the spine um, rests against a famous anatomy book from the 16th century um, made by Andreas Vesalius. Um, it's full of exquisite woodcuts and um, each page contains a figure study um, that illustrates for the, the medical student um, all of the necessary anatomy, but is also posed in a way that Vesalius thought would appeal to painters and sculptors. Um, and so they are, they're posed often uh, with uh, bits of ancient ruins and um, uh, background uh, foliage, et cetera. Um, this book has been called um, The Gift of Art to Medicine and is, is a very uh, famous, a wonderful volume. And lastly, I spent many long hours in museum storage and um, was humbled by the artifacts, the tools, the skeletal remains, 
um, it gives you an appreciation for where medicine um, has been, um, how much we have um, advances to be grateful for, um, and also how um, we are a fragile species. And these fetal skulls and skeleton certainly um, bring that into the foreground. Now, rounding out the visual journey, I end as I began with portraits taken on my most recent trip to India, in which I traveled to remote areas in the Eastern state of Odisha on the Bay of Bengal and the Western state of Gujarat on the Arabian Sea. I find portraits both the most challenging and most rewarding to take. Challenging because you have to put yourself out there one-to-one -one with your subject and ask their cooperation and collaboration in a way that respects their space and dignity before you lift the camera to your eye. Depending on the culture and setting in which you find yourself, this interaction may stir caution, curiosity, and questions from your subject especially if your presence sets you apart by your clothing, your skin color, your dress, your gear. Who are you? Where did you come from? Why are you here? Sometimes, particularly if in a remote area, it's essential to come with a local guide who speaks the language or dialect, a known and trusted figure who can explain and pave the way. I was out uh, uh, in uh, rural Gujarat. These are uh, nomadic um, uh, girls traveling with their family and living in tents, traveling by camel. <laughs> um, this local guide will have insights into the way of life in a given village, um, the social hierarchy, and um, the degree of connection of this village to the larger world. And that helps prepare you to approach the subjects um, of your intended photographs with greater understanding. And photographs are rewarding, of course, because we humans tend to be most captivated by our own species. In face, form, and figure, we recognize the many likenesses that bind us together and the subtle differences that set us apart. Above all, it is the human gaze that defines a portrait. It rivets us in a silent dialogue that speaks volumes. I see you, I respect you, I recognize our shared humanity. A connection is forged between subject and photographer and the moment is preserved for the viewer to return again and again. Within that image may be read the generosity of the subject, the intent of the photographer, and the spirit of the engagement. Having explored many genres of photography, I return again and again to the portrait as the most fundamental, um, the heart of the matter. When taking and making these images, I hear the urgent words of British author E.M. Forster, only connect. So with these images, I hope I've connected with you. And I come to a close and thank you so much for coming along on this visual journey and look forward to further discussion.